this talk is going to be a little different. I'm not going to be able to deal with the kind of specifics that you all are getting into, and I really appreciate this wonderful opportunity to learn something uh, from people. I wish I could spend more time. I've been gone the last two nights, and I'm going to be away all next week. And my wife says, you come home right afterwards. So I'm, go I'm going to do that. Uh, but it's really been, been great to hear things. My theme is kind of a big one. Medicine, in general, um, without evolution is like engineering without physics. Really, this is an introduction to evolutionary medicine, and I'm going to try to say a bit more about how I think ancestral health and mismatch theories fit into the larger picture. So Darwinian medicine now at 25 years old. This is the article that George Williams and I wrote 25 years ago with the grand title, The Dawn of Darwinian Medicine. Uh, George said, we've got to have that title. And I was a junior guy, and I said, George, can't we say something like um, some ideas about evolution, how they might possibly be useful to medicine? And he said, no. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are. But it was true. There was a science article a year ago talking about the drawn out dawn because it has grown slowly, but if you wait long enough, ideas do grow. This is a graph done by John, uh, uh, Joe Alcock uh, from University of Utah, a leading emergency room doctor who's an evolutionary biologist nice. also. And here we go. Um, exponential growth in papers in the field. So we're really coming along. These are the people who got it started. George Williams is my partner in the whole enterprise. Wouldn't have happened without him. Uh, Ernst Meyer, John Maynard Smith, Bill Hamilton, and Nico Tinbergen. So what is Darwinian or evolutionary medicine? It's very simple. It's using the basic science of evolutionary biology to solve problems in medicine and public health. Here's evolutionary biology, here's medicine, and here's evolutionary medicine. You would think this would have been done like 100 years ago, but we're still really just getting started. Most doctors have never had a chance to really learn evolutionary biology, and these ideas are still growing very fast. What it is not, there's nothing radical about it. Uh, it's not a method of practice. It's not opposed to ordinary medicine, and it doesn't make any direct clinical recommendations. Uh, all these reporters always ask me, Dr. Nessie, um, how should doctors change their practices tomorrow once they learn evolutionary medicine? How do you practice evolutionary medicine? And I say, no, that can be, maybe someday, but right now we have a really solid scientific theory like genetics or physiology or anatomy, and it suggests studies to do, but if you start making direct clinical recommendations from the theory, you're gonna get in trouble. This reminds me of uh, a fancy drink I had one time at the top of a big room overlooking the Brandenburg Gate. And the guy who was the head of the Wellcome Trust it had a few drinks, and I wanted to get him on board with evolutionary medicine. And I say, you know, Welcome should really be supporting more evolutionary medicine. And he looks at me and says, we don't need no evolutionary medicine. We don't need any more radical, wild kind of stuff. <laughs> He'd never heard of it. So this is what we're up against. You're in the Grand Canyon State. Uh, please go up there if you possibly can. Evolutionary biology on one side, medicine on the other side, a huge gulf between them. And one of the challenges for all of us in evolutionary biology is helping people to understand just the magnitude of time that we're talking about. Let's imagine, for instance, that there's a little crick going through that spot, and every year it wears away a thickness of earth equal to a dime. How long will it take to dig the Grand Canyon? Uh, a dime is called it a, mil a million years. That seems like a long time, right? But it's nothing. It's nothing. You know, it's five million years or so since we split off from our last common ancestor, 65 million years since there were dinosaurs wandering around these parts. Think about 65 miles deep or 65 miles high. Our human minds are just no good at grasping these uh, immensities. So the thing that got me from my first days in medical school is how absolutely perfect the body was or seemingly, and how absolutely badly designed it was. And I've spent my whole life trying to reconcile what works so well and what is so bad. Parts are really exquisite, uh, better than any Mercedes, way better. By the time you start in clinic, though, and you see the mundane things, the constipation and the hemorrhoids and the acne and the breast cancer and the heart attacks, you wonder yourself, is it like a, a you go on blocks or something? Um, it's almost like whoever designed this thing worked very, very hard until Friday about 3 p.m. and then went out and got drunk and finished the job quickly <laughs> in the last few hours. The question is why. Why didn't natural selection do a better job 
in making our bodies better protected against disease. Just in the last few years, after doing this for a while, I realized that the big picture here is transforming our actual perspective on disease from that of, an that of a mechanic to that of an engineer. The mechanic knows how things work and what's broken and what to do about it. An engineer takes a step back and tries to understand not just how it works, but why it is the way it is. Why does it have weak spots? Again, incredible perfection, and it's so much fun to talk with physicians because I don't have to explain what the loop of Henle is, and you all know how cool it is. I mean, it's just amazing. And the heart, of course, the eye seems really cool, except that it's not. Um, anybody who does hand surgery or even sees patients, and it's fabulous the way all those muscles and tendons, and fabulous the way it works. Um, this is the uh, intrinsic pathway. Um, grossly simplifying, but you have to test people on things so you have to simplify it. And finally, something that I just hated in medical school, and now, thanks to taking an evolutionary view, I've grown very fond of. Does anybody else have mixed feelings about intermediary metabolism? <laughs> <laughs> we all memorized it, and we heard some nice talk about aspects of it. Um, just memorizing all that stuff makes no sense whatsoever. But if you take an evolutionary perspective and you ask why it's ATP and how it got to be that way and how energy is transferred and what it's all for, it starts making sense. I'm trying to convince deans of medical schools that if you want to pe have people memorize 10,000 things, you better give them a framework to hang it all on, and we've got one for them. So that's what works well. What doesn't work well? A lot of things. Uh, how many of you are really glad you have wisdom teeth? <laughs> no. Um, an appendix? No. Um, that's a carpal, I mean, a collie's fracture. Did you ever wonder why it always breaks in the same place? I mean, people have been falling down on their hands for uh, millions of years. Why didn't natural selection make it thicker? Then there's coronary arteries. Couldn't natural selection have just made them a millimeter larger? <laughs> it would be so nice. Um, and then, what do women really want? <laughs> a zipper. Yeah. I mean, this, this whole idea of forcing a baby's head through a narrow rim of bone, it's crazy. Um, and then there's the spine. Uh, all of our patients say, what's wrong with me and my spine? And if you have an evolutionary view, you start off by saying, I'm very sorry you're having this problem, but it's not just you. Um, it's 80% of humans, at least, have severe back pain at some time in life. And it's a big problem. So here's the core insight. And I think I didn't really realize again until years had passed what George Williams and I had really done. We recognized that natural selection can explain why things don't work as well as why things do work. It's quite non-intuitive, isn't it? Natural selection makes things work better and better and better. And we're saying, look at things that seem like they're badly designed and ask why. The key here is discovering the right question. Jonas Salk said famously, what people think of as a moment of discovery is really discovery of the right question. The new question is, why did natural selection leave us so vulnerable to disease? A complete shift in perspective, again, from a mechanic's perspective to an engineer's, from describing the system to explaining how the system came to be the way it is and why it has these defects in the design. Not why some people get sick, that's all of medical research. We're trying to say why we all are vulnerable to diabetes and obesity and breast cancer and all the rest. What I learned in medical school, and most of you did too, I'm sure, is that the answer to that question was simple. Natural selection just isn't that powerful and can't do everything, so get over it. And that's the right answer for some things. But the big advance is recognizing that there are five other reasons why bodies aren't better. And a lot of the aspect of evolutionary medicine I've tried to develop is to get people to systematically and carefully try to say for each disorder which combination of these six things helps us to understand why. These are evolutionary questions. The six reasons very quickly are mismatched with the environment, most of which is the emphasis here, so I'm going to go into that in some depth. Second, coevolution with pathogens. They evolve faster than we do, so it's no surprise we still get infections. In fact, it's astounding that we can live at all without infections. It's just astounding. Uh, every trait is a trade-off. 
Some people think that evolutionary medicine says the body is perfect. They haven't bothered to do any reading. Uh, evolutionary medicine says no trait can be perfect because if you make one thing better, you're going to make something else worse. There are some things natural selection just can't do, just like my professors told me in medical school some time ago. Here's a disturbing one that I'm still working out the implications for. Natural selection doesn't shape us for health or longevity or happiness or smooth relationships. It shapes us to maximize the number of genes we transmit. Have you noticed that any of your patients sometimes do things that aren't good for them but are good for their genes, especially sexual things? <laughs> um, some of us get in trouble that way too. I mean, it's really serious that natural selection gives us motivations and envies and all kinds of things that aren't good for us, but we can't help it because we're being influenced by our genes. And the last one is the clinically most relevant, and that's defenses. Now, these aren't really reasons for vulnerability, but these are the problems our patients bring to us. They're not pathology, but they often get confused with pathology. So in the next 10 minutes, maybe 15, I'm going to go through each of these and just give you a few examples, emphasizing mismatch and trying to talk about how ancestral health fits into this larger picture. First, four cars. All, all of mine, actually, are close to being mine. That won't start. Just to illustrate that these are very different kinds of questions. This car is in a little Italian sunbeam, and my old babysitter, who was very attractive, drove up to my house in Michigan one winter with her boyfriend for coffee. I was in college, we had a nice chat, and she went out to that car afterwards, and he went out to the car, and it wouldn't start. Why wouldn't it start? Because the starter motor wasn't strong enough. That's the proximate explanation, the mechanistic mechanics explanation. What's the evolutionary explanation? That car was never intended to be even driven in Michigan, much less start in a Michigan winter. It's mismatch. This is a car I got when I was in medical school. It's really ugly, but it was really cheap. Um, I put in SAE 40 weight oil. I went out one winter morning to get to rounds. It wouldn't start. Why wouldn't it start? Because the oil was too thick. That's the mechanical explanation. The evolutionary explanation is I wanted that car to last forever because I didn't have any money, so I put an extra thick oil so the transmission would last a long, engine would last a long time. Trade-off. That's why that didn't start. Finally, I had enough money to buy a car. I bought myself a Ford Fiesta. Bad judgment, but you know, you're young. Um, I went out one morning to says I'm supposed to draw blood at 5 o'clock in the morning, back when medical students were scut persons. Um, and it wouldn't start. Being handy, I crawled underneath the car in the Michigan slush, and I found that the wire had fallen off from the starter motor. Why wouldn't it start? Because the wire had fallen off. That's the mechanics explanation. The engineer explanation is that the Ford engineers were too cheap to even put any rust proofing on that wire, and it was going to fall off. Finally, I took my family up west one time in an RV some years later, and we got to our first stop, and it was a Saturday night. Started it up Monday morning, or tried to start it up. Nothing happened. <coughs> I mean, we're trapped in a car lot someplace in northern Michigan. It's not going any place. And I tried, I called the owner, I said, it won't start. The car was running, nothing, nothing, nothing. And my family still knows not to actually remind me of why it wouldn't start. But, and unfortunately, I discovered it for myself, otherwise, who knows about my marriage. Um, it turns out that you have to put it in park before it will start. <laughs> and that's a defense. Uh, that it was, some engineer made it that way specifically so some fool uh, couldn't accidentally jerk it around by starting it. So these are the engineers' approaches to why things won't start, which are very separate. I'm just trying to, this is hard to get across quickly, but it's an entirely different kind of question we're asking. Mismatch and that little car. Diet and exercise are the huge emphases here, of big factors in, in ancestral health. I'm going to go through a few things about that. And let me just emphasize to you that I don't know much about this. Um, you guys do, so you'll have to humor me a little bit. I'm just trying to provide perspective here, and I appreciate what I've learned here. Um, first of all, these are 10 top causes of death, New England Journal article from a few years ago, 1900 and 2010. First of all, notice that death rates overall have been cut in half. Notice that um, diphtheria, senility, these things have been cut dramatically. Heart disease has gone up proportionately. Tuberculosis mostly conquered. Pneumonia mostly conquered. GI infections mostly conquered, cancer growing. I'm not sure if this is age adjusted or not, but we all know the general picture. More dramatic is this article about the epidemiological transition. 
we've had this tremendous transformation just in the course of my career, where early on, lots of people were dying from rheumatic fever, hepatitis, tuberculosis, measles, and mumps. And thanks mainly to vaccination, but partly to antibiotics and to better nutrition, we made huge progress in conquering those. In the place of those diseases, though, we have new epidemics, and few, few people are aware of just how huge they are and how fast they're still growing. We have exponential growth, not just in asthma, but in type 1 diabetes, in multiple sclerosis, and Crohn's disease. What's going on? Our health researchers are putting billions of dollars into trying to understand the mechanisms for these disorders. But what is it that's doing all of this? That's an unanswered question. Here's good evidence about what's going on in multiple sclerosis. Uh, it's increasingly clear that individuals who don't have worms in their gut, worms stimulate the IL-10 system, which basically down damps one aspect of the immune system. If you don't have worms in your gut, as all of us did for the past several million years, we're, we're all quite abnormal in lacking worms in our gut, um, then you're much more likely to pick up worm get multiple sclerosis. This is whipworm prevalence in about 40 different cultures. If, you, if there are whipworms and people in your culture, hardly anybody has got multiple sclerosis. But if there's no whipworms, big time. What about diet? Uh, we should all agree that there's gigantic epidemics of chronic disease being caused by people eating diets that they have no business eating from an evolutionary viewpoint. And I think if we emphasize that, instead of the controversies, we're going to get much further with everybody and for our patients as well. Most people these days are eating diets that were utterly unprepared for physiologically. Another thing though, everybody wants to know what's the normal diet, what's the ideal diet, doctor, please. And I think an evolutionary view is pretty clear that there is no such thing as the normal diet or the optimal diet. There are different diets optimal for, other, for different things. And again, most people are eating crazy bad diets. Almost anything they do to get closer to an ancestral diet is going to improve things. A big point is that all diets have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, many patients and others are really wishing that there was one diet that had all advantages. But I think the advance we're coming towards now, in trade-off kind of thinking, is talking about the advantages and disadvantages of more carbs versus less fat, the advantages and disadvantages of more fat versus less carbs, and all of the other subtleties that interact uh, to create diets. And it's also increasingly clear that different subpopulations um, have different dietary needs and respond differently. Uh, the amylase copy number variation in different cultures, I'm a bit skeptical about that. Um, but I know my ancestors on a tiny island in the North Sea for the last thousand years basically lived on fish. And I think that's good information for me to make use of. Plus, omega-3s are good for us. And your omega-3 to omega-6 ratio is definitely related to inflammation for good physiological reasons. This is a scary slide, right? And I wish it was just other people, but you know, all of us have some of this. The only matter is how much. And the dramatic data, this is back from, is Lauren Cordain, or I think it's Boyd Eaton, actually. From his original paper, modern American cholesterol levels around 200. But these numbers, uh, pre-industrial populations, hunter gatherers, rural Chinese, 120 to 130. And here's a question I would love to talk to some of you about if there was more time. I've had patients who try desperately to get their cholesterol down to those levels. They work out two hours a day. They don't eat any fat, they, and their levels stay up. What's going on? Is it something early in life that sets this cholesterol level? And it doesn't, there's a mystery here that I would love to be better informed about. Send me an email if you know the answer to why these populations have lower cholesterol. And again, that controversy, um, it's so hard to, I mean, what do newspapers want to publish? They want to publish things that are extreme and controversial. And that makes it very hard for people to say sensible things about diet to get a lot of attention. But again, I would support anybody who says eating a diet similar to our ancestors instead of what you get in a modern grocery store with processed foods is absolutely a good idea. But again, it's all trade-offs. Every diet has advantages and disadvantages. Um, a special treat here is to talk to you about Jim Neal. Uh, Jim Neal is the guy who invented the turkey genotype. And if you go even a mile from this hotel, you'll come to Pima Road. You've heard of Pima Cotton, and you've heard of the Pima Indians. 
that's where the whole thrifty genotype hypothesis came from. And the very first seminar I ran on evolutionary medicine was at the University of Michigan. And actually, the person I learned genetics from was Jim Neal, not in a proper class. I went in the doctor's lunchroom every day. And about three days a week, he was there. And we talked over lunch about genetics. And he's like one of the world's great geneticists. And I was completely ignorant. He says, Randy, you know, introns and exons are different. Would you like to know how? It was, he was so generous. Um, and he was, he was just great. Um, so this is a picture of game Indians in 1899, just down the street from here. They are not obese. Um, this is a current data about the percent age adjusted of diabetes. Non-Pima Mexicans, Mexican Pimas, and U.S. Pimas. It's now up to 50% that have diabetes. Talk about a really serious identifiable health problem in a subpopulation. What's going on? I've read several papers in preparation for talking with you just to try to get a bit up to speed on this. It turns out that the proportion of carbohydrates in their diet is pretty similar to what it was before. They were eating tortillas, um, quickly digestible maize products. Um, not a huge change. Yes, there's more high fructose and things in their diets now. But how, when does this transition happen? Um, overweight obesity, I'll just show you this in the, or, or because of time. This is just from 1995 to 2010, a 15-year period, very recently, since they already experienced some modernization. And during that time, rates of obesity went from 30% uh, for men to more like 55%. For women, I mean, this is huge. What exactly is happening? Is it that we found the right way to put the right combinations of fat and salt and sugar into food by companies, and that people don't have much money, so they buy cheap food like that, and they have remotes on their um, TVs and air conditioning. It probably is some combination of those things. I want us all to keep looking for other things, though. I mean, there are things like vitamin replacements for not vitamin, vitamin supplementation uh, for women in pregnancy, and folic acid is a dramatic changer of methylation patterns. And we know that methylation patterns influence tendency to develop obesity later by the so-called predict <coughs> predictive adaptive response that Peter Gluckman has studied and David Barker. So there, there, I wanted to keep considering other possibilities about what might be going on here. On to cancer. Uh, I wrote a paper on evolution of cancer a couple of years ago. <coughs> and I put my standard six things in there about which does environment have anything to do with it. And I was astounded to learn what I should have learned a long time ago. A third of all cancers are due to tobacco. I didn't know that. I knew it was bad, but I had no idea a third of all cancers, and not just lung cancer, other cancers too, bladders and others. And then this one's big too. Did you know that a third of all cancers are attributed to diet by the American Cancer Society? That includes lack of exercise as well. Um, I'm not sure exactly how they calculate that, but it's important for us to n tell our patients that it's not just attractiveness and heart disease we're dealing with here, it's cancer as well. Then we have infection and, and a lot of other things. No, I, I don't think that's very scientifically accurate. It was probably created by a committee. Because I, I, I find it hard to believe that um, pesticides, I think that uh, industrial pollutants are, are a huge factor. So I'll, I'll confess, I found the most attractive one that had readable print uh, to show to you. Um, the, the one from the American Cancer Society is essentially identical, uh, but I suspect this was influenced by a pesticide company, and they probably got it. So good point. Thank you. Breast cancer. I ask every epidemiologist I see about breast cancer, how much more common is it now? Uh, Boyd Eaton back years ago said 80 times more common. Seems extreme, but who knows? More reasonable attempts are 10 times. What's going on that's making it that much more common? Is it, for instance, uh, estrogen stimulators and that kind of thing? Two things that we should consider are the number of menstrual cycles women have and the ages at which they have them. Uh, my colleague Beverly Strassman has looked at the number of menstrual cycles in an African population that doesn't use birth control. It's 100 over a whole lifetime. And they don't start their first periods till they're 18. Modern American women, an average of 300 plus cycles, the system was never designed to take that much endocrine stimulation, and many women are now starting their periods at age 12 or so, and the breast cells are dividing in a way before puberty that makes them more vulnerable to cancer. 
Some people are experimenting with artificial, pu uh, artificial pregnancy for girls at high risk to see if that might reduce the risk. This is a dramatic one about different cultures and their levels of progesterone versus breast cancer. That's a pretty nice straight line. And the range here is almost, whoops, the range here is twofold. From the USA at the top, higher rates than anybody else, uh, to the Congo down at the bottom. What's going on here? It probably is simple, good nutrition. Once you get nutrition that's beyond what nature ever intended, um, your hormonal system cranks up for good evolutionary reasons because it's sensing that it has opportunities to reproduce more than usual. And then you get these concentrations that drive the system beyond the limits it was designed for. Now, myopia is a special <coughs> interest of mine. Um, in medical school, I said to my professor when he t told me it was a genetic disease, and it is a genetic disease, I said, how could genes that make people like me semi-blind survive if we had to live on the savanna? And his answer was, mutations happen. Natural selection is not that great. That's true, but is that plausible? How many of you have nearsightedness? Can you imagine being on the African savanna without your glasses? It would be, hello, kitty. Oh, whoops. Pardon me? Say again. If you live as a hunter-gatherer, you'd be much less likely to get myopic. That's exactly my next point. Thank you. Um, and th that's been proven not with the hunter-gatherers so much, although some people have done refractions on them, but with the Inuits. And they showed that back in 1910, there was hardly any myopia. And once well-meaning people came in and taught people how to read, myopia exploded to the regular 33% time. Now, Lauren Cordain has written a paper saying that it's not reading in things early in life, that it's exposure to glucose. So there's an open question here about what it is that's changing the system. You've question? already passed your genes along at that point, right? What? You've already passed along your genes at that point. You've already reproduced. Well, you're, you're pretty blind starting at about age 10. But here's a really important point for all of us. Um, a lot of people think that because something is highly heritable, it's caused by abnormal genes. But a large proportion of the genes that are causing chronic diseases in our time are normal genes that have no bad effects in ancestral environments. We've named them quirks because they don't do anything bad unless they interact with modern environments. So most of these genes, for instance,